All right, everyone, 12.50. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, as you probably noticed, I started recording this lecture. So just so you know, every lecture is recorded. Uh, I understand the plight of the student. So I know things happen. I know tires get flat and people get sick. So um, I just want you to know that I will try my best to record every single lecture. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't come to class. Okay, so attendance is actually pretty important because we do use Top Hat and I do have participation points uh, pretty much every single class period. So um, I'm just here to tell you a lot of students come up and ask me what's the best way to study for this class and I'm just saying if you come to class that is literally half the battle. Just like going to the gym, half the battle is getting there, right? So that's kind of what I'm going to say right now. Um, coming to class is really half the battle. Um, all right, so we are recording this lecture. What I'm going to do is just kind of go through the syllabus. I know you've probably done that already a thousand times, but I do have a lecture at the end of that introduction. So um, let's see here. Let's get started. Uh, give you kind of an overview of how things are organized. You've already accessed the Canvas site. And you kind of have looked through some of the lectures. Now, only the uh, first two sections have been open so far, the cell physiology section and neurons, okay? So um, I did get a request this morning uh, or this afternoon to actually try to open up all of them just so you can print them all out. And I will try to do that within the next few days, okay? All right, so here is our Vander's Human Physiology textbook. Um, I wouldn't tell you this if it wasn't true. This is really the tried and true uh, textbook used in a lot of different physiology courses. I highly recommend it. So if you're going on to medical school, pre-vet, graduate school, um, I would say this is one that you should keep. It is an excellent reference book, okay? So um, I've seen that there are some prices online that are pretty uh, affordable. So um, I would highly recommend that you do get this textbook. Um, there are some differences in some of the equations that I talk about in class, and we can go over that in class as well. Uh, as we go through, I might mention in the textbook, it's actually described this way. I describe it this way because of X, Y, and Z. Okay? So um, please get the textbook. It is required. Also, Top Hat is required. So if you've kind of accessed our course on through the bookstore, you'll have already noticed that, okay? Um, I did get a lot of emails about iClickers and Top Hat. I haven't actually figured out a way to integrate the two. So for now, um, it is just Top Hat, all right? Uh, in the bookstore, I feel like it's like $22.50. So if you have any concerns or comments about Top Hat, please come up after class and we can discuss it, okay? And I'll talk more about that in just a second. All right, so this is usually the format for every class. Um, what I'll do here real quick is turn on all the TVs so that you don't just, there we go, so that you can see around the room. We gotta take advantage of this active learning classroom. Um, I will roll out the group project as well. So, um, well, let's just go through this list and, and you'll see why that we're in an active learning classroom. Okay, so, at the top of every hour, oh, let me introduce myself, geez. Um, my name is Melissa Palmer, and um, I am a, a faculty member in the Department of Animal Science and CFANS. Uh, I did teach 3211 for a number of years, so I know a lot of people in CBS as well. Um, this is Meghna Vanamelli. Um, she is your TA, just so you know. You, we are both uh, listed on the syllabus, so if you need to get a hold of either one of us, is it's perfectly fine. Meghna is amazing, you guys. And, yes, uh, she does hold office hours if you'd like to get a hold of her for many of the problem sets. Okay, so I highly encourage that as well. Um, I uh, have been... I would say trained in physiology. A lot of people teach physiology that haven't been trained in physiology. I did receive my doctorate here at the University of Minnesota uh, in the Department of Integrative Biology and Physiology. Okay, so I feel like I'm well trained. I do kind of push you guys because I want you to be well trained too. So we're going to talk about what distinguishes physiology from other disciplines in just a little bit. 
Okay, so sorry about that. Introductions, me and Meghna. Um, let's now go through the class format. Okay, so at the top of every hour, I'm going to start with a top hat question. So these top hat questions help you review from the last session and uh, it gets you to think about what we're going to be going over for that period. Okay, uh, that's a readiness quiz. You can actually kind of look ahead. Uh, all the lectures are already online. And I do also put out a PDF form that has three slides to each page. If you actually want to print that out before class two, it's great for note taking. Okay, um, then I will give a lecture. Usually it'll be about 30 minutes or so. Um, and then I'll open it up for student questions. I would say one of the best things that you could do is study ahead and bring questions to class because I do try to run more of an informal classroom and I really like to answer your questions in class. Okay. Uh, then the rest of the hour is usually devoted to a workshop. So we will be doing some problem sets. We'll be doing case studies more towards the end of the semester when I want to do more of an integrative look at the human body. Um, so that's kind of where things are going. Problem sets, case studies, and group project work will be devoted to the end of the hour. Pretty good. Stop me at any time if I'm going too fast. Just want to make sure that I kind of give an overview. Um, again, a lot of students ask me how best to study for this class. I would, I'm going to tell you that the lecture slides and the lectures are the most important. Um, a lot of what, you know, the studying and, and uh, me explaining some of these fundamental concepts, coming to class is probably the number one thing you could do to help yourself. Okay, um, so listening to the lectures, come to class prepared to ask questions and work on those problem sets and case studies. And then once you've mastered the material, you can actually start to make more connections. I'm going to talk about a group video project. This is a semester long project. Videos are only about three to five minutes, but a lot of work goes into those videos. So once you've mastered maybe a, a, a particular concept that you are really excited about, you might want to do an educational video for students that are going to be in the fall semester. Okay, so again, mastering what you've learned in this class and, and applying it to the group project might be very useful or uh, exciting for you. Okay, so the first one, listen to the lectures, learn about the real world, come to class prepared, make sense of your new world. And then once you've mastered the material, start making more connections, master that new world. Okay, so as we go along, especially when we get close to exam one, there's a lot of equations. Um, I will hold a review session. Uh, I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions. I just want to make sure that um, we're all on board in, in uh, getting prepared for those exams. All right. So um, here's the syllabus. I just want to make sure that everyone has the same information here. Uh, obviously, you found the room. That's wonderful. Welcome. And the time, 1250. Um, my office is in Hacker Hall, 225A, uh, here on St. Paul campus. And I do hold office hours between 2 and 3 on Mondays, and Tuesdays 1 to 3. So. Um, you can actually, you don't even have to email to my appointment page. I'm going to show you how that works. If you go to the Word document on our Canvas site, you'll find the syllabus. It's under the tab about this course. And basically, you can just click on this link right here. Again, you don't even have to email me first. You'll see that there are slots during those office hours. You can just click a slot and go ahead and make an appointment with with me. I just want to make sure that you all know that I am accessible and you can come talk to me at any time. You can also just show up at my office during those office hours, but just know that maybe someone has already made an appointment and if you don't mind waiting, um, I'd be happy to talk to you after I'm done. Okay, pretty good? All right, any questions so far? All right, so let's keep going. All right, so uh, also um, just wanted to mention my phone numbers are there. Uh, I probably prefer if you guys contact me by email, 
um, or uh, I do require you to buy Vander's Physiology. You can see that at the end here, the 15th edition. But the syllabus actually has the 14th edition um, already organized. Um, I personally just received the 15th edition, so I will be handing out a worksheet on Friday just to update it. 14th edition is just fine. Even the 13th edition is fine. If you want to find a 13th edition, just know that the page numbers are going to be a little bit off, but I find from edition to edition it doesn't really change that much. Okay. All right, so um, going through the syllabus, these uh, are the topics that we're going to be covering before exam one. Um, I have coupled cellular physiology and neurons together because what we learn in cell physiology, we're going to be learning about uh, equilibrium potentials. What is a resting membrane potential? I know that sounds maybe scary at first if you've never heard of these concepts before. Uh, but I promise I will walk you through it. And you might not, it might not even gel when you first hear it in class, but I promise you once you start running the numbers, once you start doing those problem sets, it all comes together and it's very clear. Okay, so you'll have lots and lots of practice before exam one. And I'm telling you, uh, on the exam, the questions are almost identical to the problem sets. So if you mastered the problem sets, it's great practice for the exam, okay? All right, so I want to just put your mind at ease. These are difficult concepts, but I'm really walking you through the entire process, okay? Uh, what you learn in cell physiology will actually be applied to neurons, okay? So everything builds upon itself. That's why if you miss a class, it's sometimes difficult to catch up. That's exactly why I record the lectures. Okay, so that you can go back and look at each slide so you don't miss anything. Okay, um, all right, so uh, we'll go through neurons, graded versus action potentials, get to the neuromuscular junction. If we don't get to the review session on Valentine's Day, I will organize a review session outside of class and record it. Okay, your first exam is actually February 17th. The second section is muscle and cardiovascular physiology. So you can already see how why these two are coupled together. Everything that you learned in skeletal muscle here up front, you will apply to cardiac muscle. Okay. Um, don't purge everything from the first exam because muscle are excitable cells as well. So we'll still be talking about graded potentials and action potentials. Okay. Like I said, everything builds upon itself. Um, one of my favorite sections is cardiovascular. I find it fascinating, and we will be going through it in a lot of detail, even the electrophysiology of the heart. We'll end up with uh, vasculature and starling forces, and then your second exam is March 23rd, after spring break. Um, st I, I mentioned starling forces because we will actually pick up with starling forces. It's a great way to start renal physiology for the third section. Now, the reason you might be wondering, why is renal and respiratory physiology coupled together? Both of these systems actually play a role in regulating blood pH, okay? The respiratory system, you could pretty much hold your breath start turning blue, and then your blood would actually become a lot more acidic. So just changing your respiratory rate, you will change your blood pH. The kidney actually does a much better job of regulating blood pH, but over hours and days, so it actually takes a lot longer, okay? So that's why we have acid-base homeostasis that ends each one of these sections, and that's why they are coupled together. Uh, and your third midterm is uh, March, uh, sorry, April 20th, okay? The last two weeks of class are GI physiology and endocrinology. The reason why these two are coupled together, a lot of people don't know this, but there is a lot of hormonal regulation in the GI tract. Lots of hormonal regulation. That's why uh, endocrinology, which is all about hormones, and GI physiology are coupled together. Uh, your final exam is not cumulative. All right, it's not cumulative. It's only on GI physiology and endocrinology. 
Okay, so moving on, here's a list of basically your four different exams. Each exam is 100 points, okay? So you have four exams, each exam is 100 points. Um, you do have, I will be taking 12 top hat questions for points. Each, each one is going to be worth five points. You'll basically have 12 opportunities. Actually, you'll have way more than that, okay? Um, but I will only take 10 for points, okay? So if, again, you miss a class or your top hat isn't working, whatever the reason, again, you can drop two. There's no reason why you can't get the total 50 points for that activity, okay, those top hat points. Um, also, there are 12 problem sets, case studies, okay? Some are problem sets, some are case studies. A lot of them will either be in class or homework assignments. You'll have 12 opportunities and you'll be able to drop two. Four, these are 10 points each for a total of 100 points. And then finally, your group video project. I'm actually going to give you much more information about this on Friday. You'll be getting into your groups on Friday. I hesitated to do that today because we still have a lot of people that are still adding and dropping. So it would be kind of a pain for you if someone left the class and then basically left your group at the same time. So Friday is when I'm going to really roll out this group video project. That's for a total of 50 points. So um, essentially 400 points out of 600 are devoted to the exams. And then I would call these top hat points problem sets, case studies, and the group video project buffer points, okay? Because there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to get 200 out of 200 on those exercises, okay? I do that because the exams are hard, all right? I do try to push you into really learning this material, but I still believe in second chances, okay? So at the very end of the semester, on the same two-hour period when you take your final, you get to retake one of the first three exams. So if you do poorly on it, let's just say you had four exams that one week and you got a 30 on that exam out of 100 and you're really devastated, right? You can actually retake one of your exams at the end of the semester, okay? And I'll kind of talk to you about it at the end of the semester. I do believe in second chances, okay? So uh, what that means is I will take the higher of the two scores. If you do worse, it's no risk to you because, again, I will only take the higher of the two scores, okay? So if you got a 30, you could potentially get 100. That's a 70-point swing, all right? So um, just want to make sure that everybody realizes that going forward. Are there any questions so far? Okay, pretty good. Yes, question. Uh, sometimes they are, uh, but mm, I would say the readings are very much connected to the lecture material. So uh, I would say 99% of the time it's from the lecture material. Yes. Um, so it's the points, do you get it if you just like answer it, or does it have to be like the correct answer? Uh, it, they are participation points only. So it's worth your while to come to class. Again, these are very low risk points, just about participation. Okay, so if you get a wrong answer, at least you try, right? Okay, uh, great questions. Any other questions? Okay, so moving on. Um, so again, like I said, uh, the exams can be hard. Um, I do, uh, I want you to think about these things in detail, but I do want you to know that I'm only going to test you on things that we've talked about in class, okay? So there's not going to be any material from the textbook that we never talked about in class that won't be on your exam. Now, as it gets closer to the first exam as well, um, all of the exams are now online. So you still have to come to class. We're not going to use Proctorio. I actually used that last semester. I liked it. But um, basically, it takes up a lot of memory on your computer. And some students didn't have enough memory, basically, to run that. So we are going to be using this semester Respondus, which is just a lockdown browser. 
and I do need you to come to class. We'll have like a sign-up sheet in the back, um, and uh, you'll basically be t taking your first exam in this room on your computer, okay? If you have any concerns with that, just let me know. Uh, but so far, we used Proctorio last uh, semester, and it went pretty well. Okay, and you can pretty much get your exam scores within a day. Okay, all right, pretty good. Okay, so moving on, uh, this semester I can tell you um, uh, an A is 93% or above, A minus is 90 to 93. Uh, I say that because hardly anybody, I'm just saying, ever gets a D or fails this class, and really not a lot of people get C's either. Most people get A's and B's. Again, if you just come to class and you participate, that's really half the battle, all those buffer points. Okay, so just so you know, the ranges are listed on your syllabus. Okay, so here's Top Hat. Um, your six-digit course code is 446426. I actually sent you all an um, invitation this morning. So hopefully, go ahead and just respond. I did notice that there was probably already 20 people that had gotten their top hat and registered already. So kudos to you. Um, but if you haven't, we are going to have some top hat questions on Friday. On Friday, I won't take it for points, OK? Uh, it's just more of a trial run. But starting Monday, um, I will be starting to take top hat questions for points. All right? Any questions about top hat? I really actually like this device because it track students, number one, but also you can use your phone or your computer when you're answering questions. All right, so hopefully everyone is familiar with Canvas as well. You'll find your syllabus under this tab about this course, just so you know. Um, and uh, going to, there's our video project. Oops, sorry, I see what's happening here. Um, that's not a real site. Uh, again, all of the lectures, a lot of the recorded lectures are already online for the first two sections. Now, briefly about the group video project. Again, this is a semester-long project. What you'll need to do if you want to start thinking about it already is uh, on Friday, you're going to have to list your group members. I only want groups of about three to five people. Um, and then what you're going to do is uh, you're going to list your top five topics. Okay, And I'm going to organize you in the topics that I just mentioned. Cell physiology, neurons, muscle, cardiovascular, respiratory and renal, and then GI and endocrinology. So each person, each group is actually going to be given a general topic. And then you can actually decide on your micro topic, whether you want to focus in on a disease state, do a comparative physiology uh, video, an educational video. Um, so it's up to you. A lot of students have some different ideas to physiology in the news, like a newscast. So just be creative. Right, and um, we're going to, uh, I'll give you more information about that on Friday. Okay, any questions about that so far? It's worth 50 total points. All right, um, I will also post some of my favorite videos. One of them was from last semester, which I just absolutely loved. Uh, this is one of our CFAN students who put together a video. They actually put a, um, a Shaw or a drape over a horse that completely uh, had all of the GI tract actually listed out. And they talked about GI physiology in horses, which I thought was really fantastic. During the video, a cat jumped on the back of the, the horse. So it was very, very entertaining and very educational. So again, the comparative physiology look or um, just helping other students to study was fantastic. I'll post that so you can see kind of a good example of what I'm looking for. All right, so that concludes kind of the syllabus and going through uh, the course mechanics. Oh, Anybody sorry. have any questions? Can you make sure that yes. when they hand in the signs, they like put it at the back so I can write their names? Yes. Down. Okay, so Megna and I have actually come up with some sort of system. Okay, so with the homework assignments, we're talking about the problem sets and case studies. Let me just show you, this is the very first one. 
We're going to actually be focusing on this homework assignment. It is already on Canvas if you'd like to take a look at it. Um, this is not due until next Monday, okay? So if you turn it in with the rest of the class, that's probably optimal. That's what we're looking for. Megna will actually grade them during class so she can hand it back right after class is done. That way you have it. These are great study aids. Um, again, I understand if you know, you're know you falling behind on some of your assignments and you turn these assignments in late. Um, I, we will accept homework assignments at any time. Uh, also, but if they just, want to email them, that's fine. Too. Or if you want to email them to Megna, that's a better choice because um, I'm sure it just it's a matter of me forwarding <laughs> them to her. Um, uh, basically, emailing them is just fine, too. Uh, I would just say don't wait until the end of the semester to turn in all 12 assignments because the problem sets and case studies are going to help you study for each exam. Okay, so it really is worth your while to actually turn them in on time, get them back, use them as a study aid for the exam. At the most, they have to wait a day. Yeah, we're, we're going to try to figure it out so that you only have to wait a day, basically, before you get your uh, problem sets back. All right, so any questions about the homework assignments? All right, so let's go ahead and talk about what is physiology, okay? Um, I think this is an important conversation to have because a lot of people think they know what physiology is, but they're surprised when they actually go through this class. So um, a lot of people equate physiology. You've heard of physiology and anatomy. Anatomy is the structure and physiology is the function. So you might say this is the heart and the heart pumps blood, right? That's a pretty good description. And I think a lot of people that aren't trained in physiology may think that that's acceptable. But physiology is really a discipline in which scientists look at the human body almost like an engineer would. So we're going to be talking about the three major themes in physiology, which are homeostasis, control systems, and forces and flows. So as we go through this uh, semester, you're going to be hearing me talk about Ohm's law ad nauseum. Ad nauseum. I'm going to be talking about Ohm's Law over and over and over again. We're going to start off basically describing Ohm's Law in terms of chemical terms. We'll be talking about Fick's Law of Diffusion and Flux, Concentration Gradients, and Resistance. Okay? So um, let me just write Ohm's Law down so we can start off with Ohm's Law. Okay, go back to the document camera. I'm going to write on the back of this, so sorry guys. Ohm's Law is basically a driving force. Driving force is equal to, so DF is driving force, is equal to some kind of flow or flux current in elect electrical terms times resistance. All right, so just to give you an example, like I said, you're kind of looking at all of these functions like an engineer would look at something, okay? Uh, I always like to start off, so this is Ohm's Law. I better write that down so, again, you'll see this over and over and over again. Ohm's Law. So I like to start off describing this like garden hose physiology. Garden hose physiology physiology. Everybody's played with a garden hose before. You have some physical intuition about it, right? Um, water flows through the garden hose. What is the driving force? You can think about that. Maybe talk to your neighbor for a minute. What is the driving force for the movement of that water through the garden hose? Everybody's super shy all of a sudden. Turn to your neighbor, introduce yourself, say hi. <laughs> I'm 
hoping to be able to get their grading done in class. That way we don't have to wait. Yeah. But again, I think when I like look at their problem sets, my first priority is going to be writing it down. Yeah. Because then I can grade it at my own pace. But I just want to make sure I have a record of class yeah. submitting. I don't want to make that mistake again. <laughs> All right, everyone. What's your guess? What is the driving force? What's the driving force? We are talking about garden hose physiology. At table two here, my nice. name is Bailey, oh, and I believe the driving force is the difference between the two pressures at the ends of the hose. That is absolutely correct. And use the microphone. And you're at number two. Nice. Okay. So that's wonderful. Um, yes. Okay. So Megna and I are going to actually talk about the microphones on each table. Thank you so much for, for actually um, doing that. Um, all right. Absolutely right. The driving force is the pressure gradient, right? The pressure gradient. Water is always going to flow from high pressure to low pressure. That's the driving force. Now you can kind of see, uh, you can apply that to blood flow and air flow, right? So Ohm's law is key. It's one of the central concepts in physiology. Uh, that's gonna be equal to the flux or the flow. That's what F is, right? The flow with the garden hose is really the water moving through the garden hose. Uh, in mils per second, okay? It's the river. It's kind of a river of flow. And then you multiply that by the resistance. Okay, so for the garden hose, if you kink the garden hose, right, you're going to restrict the flow downstream. What's going to happen to the pressure? Upstream, the pressure is going to go up, down, down from that, downstream from that kink, the pressure is going to go down. Okay, so this is key. This is kind of giving you an idea of what Ohm's law is all about. So going back to our, um, our PowerPoint presentation here, this is how we're actually going to take a look at life processes, right? We're going to be talking about different equations that describe biological, physiological processes. And um, you will need a calculator actually for the first three exams. But you'll see right away why they're so important, OK? And don't worry. A lot of people come to this class. They may say to, to me, you know, I've been out of school for 10 years. Math really isn't my thing, right? It's actually very intimidating. Uh, I do walk you through the problem sets to make sure that you understand how to use these equations, OK? All right. What you'll also notice after kind of going through all the topics that I go through the living systems at many levels. We actually start off at the molecular level, the cellular level, and move into the organ systems until finally the GI tract is multiple organs that play uh, similar roles, digestion, absorption, secretion, in a uh, organ system, the GI tract. Okay? So we go from the molecular level and kind of zoom out to a whole organism level. That's where we do a lot of case studies, and you can see that the exercises are a lot more integrative. All right, then we'll also talk about exercise, how living systems actually respond to physical activity, and changes in their external environment. All right, also, just so you know, we will, the case studies are going to focus on pathophysiological states, diseases, and how we treat them as well. Um, what do physiologists study? I think this is kind of a hilarious slide. I actually downloaded this slide a long time ago from the American Physiological Society. There's actually a link to the APS on your Canvas site. Um, this actually details what physiologists study. Sometimes they study plants, vertebrates. I think these students at the top here, the top left hand, again, the APS may not be marketing geniuses, um, but these two seem to really love physiology. I'm trying to find my arrow here. The two in the middle here. They love physiology. They love being in class. This guy's not so sure about physiology. And then this guy, it looks like if I say Ohm's Law one more time, he's just going to get really mad, <laughs> right? So um, I don't know why they picked this slide, but I 
got a chuckle out of it when I downloaded it. So at the very end of this slide, you can actually see invertebrates. A lot of scientists use invertebrates. You don't need an iCook protocol, actually. Um, and one of the most, I'll just mention the bottom here, cephalopods, one of the most famous experiments uh, was in 1952. Uh, we'll be talking about this when we get to neurons. Uh, Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley actually wrote a series of five papers in 1952, if you're not familiar with this. They actually did all of their experiments on the giant squid axon. Okay, this is a huge axon. What they did was they elucidated the ionic basis of the action potential waveform. Okay, so if you want to take a, a, a closer look at what they did, they actually did win the Nobel Prize in 1963, very impressive, and we will be talking about their experiments and what they found, what they made clear uh, when we get to neurons. We're going to be applying what we learned in cell physiology and applying it to neurons, which is really fantastic. So what are some kinds of questions that physiologists ask? Just one example is uh, maybe they Scientists have engineered knockout mice that actually have diabetes. And physiologists may isolate different cardiac muscle from a normal rat and a rat that has diabetes and look at it from different perspectives. Uh, I consider myself more of a cell physiologist, so electrophysiology was something I routinely did, working with patch clamping, oozing chambers, right? And you can actually see what different ion channels are expressed um, and what their biophysical nature was uh, using different electrophysiology techniques. So that's something that scientists may do uh, as a physiologist. So what is physiology? Again, it's a study how living organisms work, and we're interested in basically the underlying function from a very a certain perspective and integration. So we'll start from the cellular level and move up to the whole animal. Again, many of these processes are described quantitatively. So again, you will be using, you'll have to bring a calculator for each exam, okay? Okay, so here's really the heart of this particular lecture. This is what I really want you to get out of this lecture. It is the three major themes in physiology. And what I'd like you to do is think about each of these major themes as we go through the entire semester, okay? You'll be seeing these themes over and over again. So homeostasis is the first one. If you break the word down, homeo actually means similar or same, and stasis means standing still, okay? So what that means is basically homeostasis is a process in which the body maintains constancy of its internal environment. And we'll talk more about that in just a second. You have mechanisms in place that control your internal environment. Try to keep them constant over time. So then that brings us to what are some of the compensating regulatory responses? What are some of those mechanisms? And then we'll start talking about control systems. It's the control systems that actually perform the compensating regulatory responses to maintain homeostasis. And in a minute, I'll be talking about negative feedback mechanisms and positive feedback mechanisms, okay? And then finally, my favorite, forces and flows. The role of transport in physiological systems where Ohm's law is basically key. Okay, so starting with homeostasis, I do want to roll out, we kind of talked about the formal definition here. There's a few more that I'll I'll talk about, but I do like to talk about physiology from a historical perspective, okay? Um, throughout this semester, you'll be hearing about different scientists. I like to kind of roll that out because it gets you to think about what they were grappling with at that point in time and, how, and their genius, basically, behind each of their contributions, okay? So the first one, actually, uh, when I do attend experimental biology, where the APS, the American Physiological Society, uh, Society actually attends, they have a big 
big organization that attends experimental biology. Um, this is a national meeting for scientists, right? Uh, there's a lot of keynote speakers. And two of the keynote speakers usually speak at the Claude Bernard keynote speak, uh, <laughs> conference uh, talk and Walter Cannon. So I always like to pay homage to these scientists as well. So Claude Bernard actually lived between 1813 and 1878. He was a French physiologist. And he came up, he coined the term internal milieu. Okay, so I'm not French, and there's a lot of French terms in this class. I butcher every single one. So sorry, I'm apologizing right up front. Uh, he developed the concept of the internal milieu and recognized that many animals regulate their internal environment, even if the external environment changes drastically. Okay, this is a picture of Claude Bernard. He's very serious about physiology. He's actually saying to you, come to class. It's important that you come to class. No, it's not really, but it looks like it, doesn't he? It looks very stern. So, uh, the internal milieu is basically the ex extracellular fluid that surrounds all of your cells, all right? It's the internal environment of an organism or the extracellular fluid. And it's actually tightly regulated, right? This is the fluid that surrounds each of your cells, exchanges nutrients and wastes, and acts like a buffer, right? Uh, electrolytes are tightly controlled inside the cell and outside the cell. pH, right? We'll talk more about this in just a second, but... It was uh, Claude Bernard that actually said constancy of the internal environment is the condition for free life. So if you actually think about poikilotherms, different snakes and reptiles, um, they're kind of a slave to their environment. To regulate their temperature, they have to move. If they want to heat themselves up, they move into the sun. If they want to cool themselves down, they have to move into the shade, right? So as homeotherms, as mammals, right, um, it kind of lets us live a free life. It's the condition, if you can control your internal environment, it's the condition for free life, okay? All right, Walter Cannon is the second scientist I wanted to talk about. He lived uh, about 50 years after Claude Bernard, and he actually was the one that coined the term homeostasis. Most of his work was with the autonomic nervous system. He recognized that the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system actually regulated things like blood pressure, right? To keep, you had mechanisms in your body to keep your blood pressure, mean arterial pressure, constant, relatively constant, okay? So he realized the importance of the autonomic nervous system in maintaining a relatively constant internal environment. This is Walter Cannon. Looks a little kinder, gentler these monkeys here, chimpanzees, I should say. Um, all right, so keeping, keep going here. Here is a formal definition of homeostasis that I want you to commit, not commit to memory, but have in the back of your mind as we go through the semester. It refers to the dynamic mechanisms that detect and respond to deviations in physiological variables from their set point values by initiating effector responses that restore the variables to optimal physiological range. Now, basically it keeps them relatively constant. Okay, so what does that mean? What, I, what do I really mean by that? Homeostasis is actually a very dynamic process, not static. And let's just take uh, eating a meal, for example. When you eat a meal, what usually happens is glucose is absorbed. Your blood glucose levels rise. I do have a lot of nutrition students in this class as well. Um, and then insulin is released into your system to help your cells take up that glucose. Sometimes your blood glucose levels may fall then out of range and then you'll release glucagon. 
So essentially what happens is your blood glucose levels will oscillate wildly, especially after you eat a meal, but you have mechanisms in place to bring them back into homeostatic range. Okay, so it's a relatively constant process. So uh, we'll also be talking about exercise. How does the body diminish the effects of body temperature as well? This is an important concept. When homeostasis is maintained, we refer to this as physiology. If it's not, we refer to this as pathophysiology. Okay? All right, so just keeping that in, in mind, the homeostatic system makes adjustments to lessen the internal impact of major external dis uh, disturbances. So we've already mentioned a few. Let's take a break for a minute. What I want you to do is, you've already kind of met your neighbor, why don't you come up with some variables in your body within which homeostasis is maintained. What do you think? We've already mentioned a few in this lecture, but there's a lot more. Okay, so give me some examples of physiological conditions requiring homeostasis. Go. Oh my, I really don't want to go to East Bank after this. But it's a 4 to 5.15 class. How am I doing? Does this get out at 1.40? 1.40. 1.50, 1.40. That's okay. Yeah. I can, I can get through the rest of it. Did you get done with what you... Okay. Like, don't put things in your body, like alcohol, because you just take that back. That would be something. This is actually a much better spot to be in than all the way back there. All right. Since their assignment isn't due until Monday, I can get my like I have a notebook laid out for this class, but I have to go find it. Okay. So I can get that out and start like writing down like separate pages for each assignment, so I can track who's submitting what. Sweet. All right. I can see that we're running out of time, so I'm going to take some thoughts, some ideas. What do you say? What are some of your ideas? Body temperature, absolutely. Air intake? Air intake, yes. Okay, so uh, gas exchange? Yes. Gas exchange is one of them. What else? Gas exchange, oxygen, carbon dioxide, yes. I said like the level of water in your body. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, water in your body. So. Actually, that's a really good one because uh, if you think about it, um, osmoregulation, uh, the kidney plays a huge role in osmoregulation. However, you can also think about it with cells, cell volume regulation, also tightly regulated. What else? What else? These are great answers. Yes? The pH. pH, absolutely. So we'll be talking about how pH is controlled by the kidneys and the respiratory system. Yes. What else? What else? Um, what do the kidneys do? What's another um, process? Filtering toxins. Yes, filtering toxins. Thank you. Um, so nitrogenous wastes are actually tightly regulated as well. Yes. Hormones, perfect. We'll talk about negative and positive feedback mechanisms next time. I think I just have a couple more that I'm looking for. Blood pressure. Blood pressure, perfect. We'll be talking about mean arterial pressure and how it can be regulated by increases in heart rate, stroke volume, sympathetic nervous system, basically. All right, so let's actually take a look at the full list here that I have. Temperature, concentration of waste products, gas exchange, pH, energy requirements like glucose, water ion balance, perfect, and volume and pressure. So one of the major differences between regulators and conformers is that regulators actually have mechanisms in place to control their inter, uh, internal environment. 
Whereas conformers a lot of times live in environments that are basically constant. So they don't have mechanisms. It doesn't mean they can't tolerate extreme changes in their environment, but they don't have the mechanisms in place. They just pretty much can live with those external uh, disturbances. Okay, so that's a major difference. Next time we'll start off, I see that we are pretty much out of time, we'll start off with control systems, forces and flows, and uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you would print out the first problem set, we'll get to that and get through some of the first questions on Friday. Okay, so have a wonderful Thursday. I will see you on Friday. Oh boy. Off to East Bank Ghettos. Well, I didn't get through as much as I'd like, but we didn't power what? through. I didn't get through as much How as much I wanted do you to. Have to go. I wanted to get through just control systems and forces. Well, and to be fair, it is an introductory class. I know. So I know. There's only so much you can do. Yes. Oh boy. We will get through control systems and forces and flow on Friday. It'll probably just be another 10 minutes. Hi. Yes, I'm just going to.